day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the 40 Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Today's podcast episode is proudly sponsored by Timo, the award winning app designed to support neurodivergent people just like yourself with routine and scheduling. Head to your app store and type TIIMO to learn more. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening. Welcome back to the 4TOT podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. How are you doing? I am doing very well, the clocks have gone back and while that might have left me with little time to sleep, I'm feeling good today. Today we're going to be doing things a little bit differently than normal. For any of you who have listened to the past episodes, a year or so ago I interviewed a girl called Lottie from Lots Voicing Autism about her experiences being misdiagnosed and being sent to a psychiatric hospital. Very intense story, but very eye-opening. With these podcasts, I usually try to focus on specific topics, but today we will be diving deep into the past of a very inspirational woman. Francesca is a business owner, YouTuber, and she's recently started up her own clothing brand with her partner. She goes under the alias of French Fries, (laughs) I think that's right, isn't it? That's how you say it. (laughs) But don't let the name deceive you. Francesca has had a really tough past. She struggled against drug addiction and homelessness since a very, very young age. But through her recovery, she has really come a long, long way and has a lot to share from her autistic perspective. If you are under the age of 18, or have any particular triggers around talk about drugs, please do not listen to this podcast. This is not for you. To anyone else, I feel like, you know, it's, it's very eye-opening stuff, and I'm sure you will greatly enjoy it. Francesca, how are you doing today? Hi, Thomas. Good, good. Thank you. Excited and yeah. nervous. And, uh, excited for being in your, in your show, definitely. Uh, we we had a very long pre-chat uh, a couple of days ago, I think. Yeah. Where you told I think you you told me your entire story in one sitting. And usually, usually I'd get a bit tired and I'd get like losing concentration. <laughs> but yeah. I thought your story was incredibly interesting. And uh, yeah, how have you been coping during COVID? Um. Well. Uh... Just try to stay positive. Try to, you know, I feel like a lot of us have been from the beginning thinking it's going to be over soon. It's going to be over soon. Um, definitely, I feel like I've been mourning and uh, trying to mourn for everyone that's been uh, really, really having a horrible time because I'm sure most of us have been having a tough time. It's definitely, yeah. it definitely affected my business. It definitely affected. Uh, I guess the only other thing that I can complain about, uh, because for the most part, I'm really resilient. I always try to find, like, look at the positive side of things. Yeah. But it's important. Yeah. I try to stay optimistic. Try to be like, like, oh, well, you know, I can do this. You know, be like, I, I, when, when everything starts closing down, I'm like, okay, I can take a break from things. You know, I can use, it, it helped me to use the time to start working, actually start working on my YouTube channel. So kind of like, give me that push to be like, okay, Francesca, you have <laughs> no excuses now. And it helped me to do a lot of uh, things and, and save money on not going out and just, you know, try to focus on mm. doing all these side projects that I want to do, which was mainly YouTube. It's interesting that you say that because one of the the reasons why I put out my documentary um, was because of COVID. You know, like yeah. when, when, when you go into such a massive change in society, you kind of have to... I think for, for autistic people especially, you kind of have to latch onto something to give you a bit mm-hmm. of structure. 
Yeah. And editing the documentary was something that took a lot of my attention and stressed me out, but it was, it's, I guess it was sort of like a little side project that I could latch on to. <laughs> yeah, you know, I like, feel like I was on that, that boat too. It was actually really stressful when I started YouTube because, well, it's a whole other story, but it was a lot of uh, misinformation that I got. And then I purchased this, this program that was like, kind of helped me kind of like how to navigate through YouTube and do it the right way. But it was not really, it was, it gave me all the wrong like tips and stuff. And it just wasted a lot <laughs> of time doing, because I'm not really good with social media, to be honest. Um, I, <laughs> I don't really spend a lot of time. I just don't understand social media, honestly. It's just something that I, enjoy it on a very small little like doses of it but yeah. i cannot be hours and hours on social media because it overwhelms me a lot so yeah. starting youtube i was telling me that i have to do a lot of social media and i was like wow that's one thing i didn't want to do. it's awful <laughs> it's the it's literally it's literally the thing that i despise the most about podcasting and youtube thing <laughs> yeah especially because i'm dyslexic so for me reading a lot i always read things if, if i try to read really fast i read things wrong i type wrong like it's too much of my of the side of things that i like I, I like to write but i like to take my time on it and social media mm -hmm. I do it fast and read a lot it's just overwhelming yeah I, I i completely agree with you i don't think it's particularly friendly for autistic people i know a lot from speaking to yeah. other people it's i mean I'm, i mean i did a podcast of indy andy about it very recently don't know if you've heard of him he's a he's sort of a autism yeah. youtuber yeah yeah, yeah. I, I speak with him lovely sometimes. guy he's yeah he's very nice but yeah we talked about social media and stuff and i don't there's there's something about it that the sort of constant especially when you're producing podcasts and videos and any sort of creative media that it kind of kind of stresses you out because you feel like you always yeah. have to look at it and you always have to post something and do something and yes. talk to people. <laughs> One thing that you mentioned to me earlier was that you have been snowboarding quite a bit. That is like, uh, being in the UK, we don't have a particular, particularly large amount of snow other than sort of indoor snowboarding arenas and stuff. But any time that I've done it, I really enjoy it. I can't do skiing for some reason because my legs just always just spread apart. But <laughs> snowboarding is is something that I, I think is really cool. How yeah. did you get into that? Okay, so yeah. So snowboarding is my drug of choice. I have to say it's really <laughs> addicting. But yeah, pretty much... Um, uh, I thought it was cool. We were going to go with some friends uh, years ago, and it, it was a really bad uh, weather. So they didn't recommend us to go to spend money if it was going to be like really slippery, bad weather, like it was raining. And the other guys still went for it because they kind of had a little bit of more experience. Yeah. So I was like, I just stayed in the car and didn't do it. And then after that, well, because I had problems with with uh, my boyfriend at the time, um, I guess kind of like it was we got in a really big fight that day and just never thought about snowboarding again mm -hmm. like it was kind of like i what do you call it i paralleled um with like a bad experience kind of like i just just never had it just i was i got involved with other things i just didn't think like oh whatever you know snowboarding i don't think i'm gonna be able to go, be good at it or anything i just didn't know what i was missing so uh my now boyfriend fiance and he's done snowboarding before and he mentioned a couple of times that he wanted to go and do more outdoor activities he wanted to do you know, go to the, to the, every time we'll go on vacation, we'll go to Mexico. So we're like, oh, we'd like to go, you know, to mountains, snowboarding one day, like, and where I live specifically is very suburban, like, so it's like a small little, those little American, like movie stories, like a uh, <laughs> neighborhood. So it's really clean. It's really nice. All the houses look alike, which I particularly don't like, but I guess it makes the city look really uniformly, right? That's crazy. That's crazy because uh, in the UK, I don't have either of those in the unlike the <laughs> entire the country. The I entire say, country. So, yeah. <laughs> I was always thinking like, it would be so cool to live in the UK or live in Spain or whatever. But then I, then I think about like, oh my God, now that I got in, into snowboard, it's like, wow, like, can I go for years without ever going snowboarding and stuff like that? You know, let alone months. But it, 
he mentioned a couple times. And then I was like, well, you know what? Um, like I thought I was probably going to be really expensive and stuff, but yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, I promise you we're, I'm going to save up and I'm going to make it happen um, to, to go to do a, a winter trip together. I promise you, you know, like I wanted to do it, but I just didn't know like, like how much fun I was going to have. If I didn't know like how much worth it it was gonna be, like I would have like literally made it happen like sooner, I guess, found figure out the way. And so I did. We saved that. We got this, we got even really hooked up. We got this beautiful cabin and we got it like, at a great price. Mm-hmm. And it was just really great and everything. And I got a couple a couple friends to to join us and everything. And and one of my friends, she was a pro uh, snowboarder. So she, instead of taking me on the baby ride to kind of like get learning right there, she took me on the medium on ride. On the big one. Oh, on the no, medium not a big one. one. It was like like the intermediate, like one like right, one, once you get the kind of like Just standing push, push up and everything. Just push you down the hill. Push yeah, you down so, the hill. You can do it. <laughs> and I, I promise ah! you, it's not that hard. It's not hard at all. You'll be like fine. But because the very top of it is the more inclined one, it was yeah. way too hard for me to stand up on the board when you're downhill. Yeah. So I went on the baby ride, and I'm, so I'm going on the baby ride. I dropped my glove, and it was like a really expensive glove. So I'm like, oh, my God, my glove. Wait, please. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think somebody grabbed it or something. And as soon as I got off the ride, I didn't think of anything else. I didn't think of nothing, but I needed to go get the glove. So I got on the board, and I just, I'm just sliding down. And I was just kind of like, I feel like it was all my fears. It was all in my head, my fear of falling. I wasn't thinking about falling. Yeah. I was thinking about was getting thinking my glove. About glove. And I slide <laughs> all the way down. And it was such an like an amazing experience. I was like, oh my God, it feels so good. And I'm like, I can do it. Like I actually don't suck as much as I, I thought. Can. Like I can do it, just need more practice. I just need to, you know, hang in there and stuff. And I just kind of like, it was such an, an, an a joyful experience just being in the snow with trees and forests. Such a great vibe. I was like, man, this feels so good. Like I don't remember feeling like no party in Mexico made me feel like that great of a of a feeling just being in nature and having that mm-hmm. beautiful view. It was such such a such a different, such a different experience. That's one of the things that made me sad when COVID started. That was the what was that was my first thing that was like, no, I can't go snowboarding. They, they <laughs> shut down the mountain early and everything. It no. sucks, doesn't it? I was so sad because of I've that. I've had to stop like some of the things that really because I I struggle quite badly with mental health and it, I find it difficult to enjoy things at the best of times. But one of the things that I really enjoyed doing was very simple, just going to a local, the local coffee shop, sitting in the exact same chair that I always sit in and really? writing, listening to music. But obviously right. when COVID came, came across, oh. that, that sort of went off, off the table. And again as well, uh, with the gym as well, that, that was sort of a big, a big hit to my routine. I know. It sucks. Can you do any tricks? Um, I feel like it, like anything with practice, you can get good at things. Um, I have this friend who's a really good uh, football player. And I, I suspect, because when we had a conversation, I told him everything about the you know spectrum and stuff. And he was like, hmm. He was like, Francesca, do you think I might be you know autistic? And I was like, Patrick, I think you are, actually. So I think he might be better. <laughs> Sometimes, like, there's certain things I'm thinking, like, oh, no, this person is really good at sports, so there's no way he's autistic, right? Yeah. But I think about, like... There's a little like, bit of a stereotype around Yeah, that. there's a stereotype. And you think, I'm like, wait a second. Patrick, you're kind of really odd, to be honest, you know? Uh, and, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if it wasn't the fact that um, he never had the problems that I had. So every time I would think, like, people that are autistic were like me. We're, like, always yeah. getting in trouble for things, you know? But there's autistics that really, really don't have social... like they don't get in trouble a lot. Like they go under the radar a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. What about, what about you? Okay, what sorry, about sorry. your snowboarding? <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. It's fine. As, <laughs> as, as, as I mentioned, like, I don't, oh, actually, I don't think we've mentioned yet, but didn't you say that you had some sort of ADD kind of ADHD? Yeah, I'm ADHD. I'm, I'm, I'm like the stereo, I'm, I, I fit a lot of the stereotypical autistic <laughs> traits. Like I have ADHD, I have the dyslexia. Well, I say I have, like it's a disease and stuff. I don't think I have it. That's just how our brain is wired. But my mm. brain is like wired like the very stereotypical uh, Asperger's, right? Like the, mm. the little professors type of thing. One of my friends is very, is, is 
sort of on the ADHD side of life. I think he's oh. actually got a diagnosis recently. Your dad? No, one of my friends. Oh, um, one of your friends. One of my friends, Jack. And he talks he talks a lot. <laughs> he talks very <laughs> fast and he do- he darts between things a lot. Yeah. But we kind of I don't know, there's something about like the aut- the autism ADHD dynamic that works. Well, I mean, it, specifically for me, I'm quite direct and blunt. Um, so sometimes that can be good because my friends are sort of he goes off into different directions and I'm like, Jack, yeah. come back down. Come this is down. This. <laughs> I like when people are direct with I like it. I don't know why people have a problem with people being blunt and stuff. Hmm. There's those kind of things in society have always confused me because I don't really think a lot about the people in the autistic thing that's the neurotypicals who make the norm, but I don't think mm. that's true. But that's a whole other topic that I could probably talk to you about <laughs> later on. One thing that I wanted to ask you is, when were you diagnosed or when did you first identify with, with being autistic? Well, um, I would have never in a million years think that I was autistic because uh, when I was young, Especially uh, uh, Google was starting to get popular. Not people were using yeah. it. I I wouldn't even. My parents wouldn't even let me use the. Like I used to think the internet was the hardest thing. It was kind of more complicated back then. You know, you think of autistics, you think of like geeks <laughs> and stuff, right? Yeah. And I was like the opposite. From I'm the like separate stereotypes. <laughs> when did you When did you first like come across? Um, so it was actually my mom. Thing? It was actually my mom, because to me, autism was uh, somebody who was intellectually challenged. That's what I thought autism was. Mm, somebody who didn't like speak, actually. Disabled. Yeah, uh, to me, it was somebody who didn't speak. That's the only, I once saw a video about an autistic, uh, somebody had, whose kid had autism. It was a like one of those true story reenacted uh, show. And the, to me, I was like, wow, that was like such a rare, like a very rare case of like, mm-hmm. you will never meet somebody. Like, you will hardly ever meet somebody with autism. Like, that's what I thought it was. And somehow, nobody in my city, especially, nobody would ever talk about that ever. Like, it was not something that, not even, like, I was sent to so many psychologists. None of them even thought about the possibility of autism. Like, ever. Really? Yes, ever. That's like, crazy. No teacher, nothing. It's and it's really bad for, for for girls getting diagnosed. It's it's really for hard boys. for them to... Yeah, even, even for boys. For boys. I, I have a, I had a neighbor actually who he, you you see him like he is the like very very stereotypical autistic too. Not like Raymond type, but but he he <laughs> he's Babbitt. very. He, you can see he's very different. He'll make space and be like, hmm. Mm, he makes spaces and he's very stubborn and he's like a ki- like a big kid and stuff in many ways. But yeah, yeah so. So you you if you if people knew about autism, you would think like, oh, that kid is like either autistic or something, you know. Um, but it, even he got diagnosed to like very later on because uh, psychologists and in, in, in third world countries like Mexico uh, were very even to this day they're very uh, behind on new yeah. uh, studies on all these things that the you actually I heard that even like places like France and stuff like that they yeah, don't know France as much is- as things. And it's right France next is to terrible. it. terrible. It's, it's crazy because I, I was talking to Dr. Morty <laughs> very, uh-huh. very recently in the last episode. Uh, and he's telling me about how France is just so behind on, on like scientific research because they just don't learn English. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, they well, don't learn it to a, to a high degree. And English is like the, the main sort of scientific language <laughs> oh wow like i even have like a, a aunt who's a teacher and they now they're doing like courses on teaching them like the science ca- ca- catch the science for autism and stuff like that but even she like doesn't fully get what autism is because yeah. she actually was i call her my aunt but she was actually married she's like my grandfather's uh wife yeah so my grandfather I know for a fact, like, that's where I get him. Well, that's what I thought. I'm pretty sure that's where I get my autism. Because you can tell, can't you, with Because I think grand, my, and my, dad, my dad is also <laughs> on the spectrum. But, but for sure, my grandpa. Like, my grandpa, yeah. for sure, he's autistic. And, and it's so funny. Like, she doesn't, like, when you, like, she got a course of explaining what autism is. But she doesn't think, like, oh, yeah, that's my, my late husband. Like, that's how she did. Because I would tell her, like, yeah, so my, my YouTube channel, you know, it's about this. It's about that, you know, because. 
da da da. Like uh, my experience with autism, and she was like, "You're not that. You don't have that. You don't have it. Don't don't say that. Don't, don't think that of yourself. You know, she kind of like says it like that. I'm like." Um, I actually, I actually yeah. do, do have it. I'm not joking, you know. I'll have you know. I'm not confused. <laughs> I don't. I didn't create a whole YouTube channel just because I was like maybe wondering if I was, you know. When did you? When did you like? Um, was it something that your psychologist picked up, or is it something that you researched no. yourself? So what I was gonna say is that nobody ever really talks about it or nothing, but somehow. Uh, and this I found out very recently because at the time I just thought my mom just came across some video like randomly or somebody kind of like give her the hint to be like, Hey, check out this video. And she was all like, Oh, that is Francesca. But no, it turns out that she, my mom was already suspecting for a while, I guess. Cause mm. all of like, I always, she always wondered like, what was so like, what was with me? Why was I so different? Like she always, always wondered like, why was I so, um, like, for example, like, uh, since I was little, like, there's a word in Mexico called idiático. Um, I forgot. I don't think there's a translation in English, but it's kind of like meaning it's similar to, you know, idiosyncratic uh, yeah. or fussy. Like, kind of mm-hmm. like, it's kind of like a word like that, which somebody has, like, very strong ideas about something. So, like, I was very fussy about food, very fussy about sounds. Yeah. Uh, although my dad, I, I kind of build a high tolerance because my dad would always blast music in the car until I was a baby. But there were still certain songs that I just could not stand. There was just certain music, certain sounds, and certain volumes that I would just want to puke. Like, I remember, <laughs> for example, like Mexican banda, like, I cannot stand that type of music for my life. Like, I, I think it's the worst music ever invented, but that's Thai just music me. Is, is not good for the old sensory system. Yeah, with, system. Really, like, with the trumpets <laughs> and the high, like, the what do you call the ones, the things that clap just, and stuff. Uh, and- things that are, like, screechy and really, like... Yeah, loud it, noises. Yeah, so if I'm in a club, like if I'm at a party and they put that music, like I'm out, like the vibe, <laughs> like no, I cannot place. stand it. One time I wanted, I wanted because I was when you're drinking, you're kind of a little more tolerant to things, but yeah. uh, with alcohol, yeah. I'll be more tolerant. And I will be at a party. My friends wanted to go to this one club where they play that, and I was like, fine, you know, I don't want to be like the party pooper. So I was there, and the entire time I was like with my ears, <laughs> with my hands on my ears, so I could not stand it. And I just started feeling bad, worse and worse and worse. And so I finally walked out of the bar. I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't be here. So when when was the the turning point? Like, was it was it your mom that that? It was my mom. It was my mom who just kind of like wanted to figure out what was what was I always had. Like, it was just so many things. It was just always kind of like I was like to her a problem child. Like I was yeah. eh, eh, because I was always be called by. Like she always, she every year I'd be called by teachers, uh, principals. I was always in the principal's office for one reason or another. So she was always trying to be like, like there's a way that everyone else is wrong and she's right. Like there has to be something wrong with my daughter because like why is that everyone is always saying those things? You know that's how she. Did she go to a psychologist or is it something that you did? No, um, actually. After talking to her. So when this happened, I was already. It was after me already kind of like messing around with drugs. Um, you know, with drugs. Which we're so going to talk she, about in a bit. <laughs> she just kind of like wanted to look up, like somehow she just kind of like thought, like maybe it's autism. Maybe it is. Like she just kind of had that little idea in her head. That's what she thought. I don't know where did she get some small speck of information about autism, but that was something that she was. Because when I first moved to this country, she thought, oh, I know what you have. It's ADHD. That was the first thing she 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 found out about ADHD. She just she moved to this country, so I was like, "Oh yeah, uh, attention deficit disorder." She said, mm-hmm. and I'm like, "Um, yep, that sounds about right. That sounds like what I have." <laughs> so the ADHD sort of came before the autism. Yeah, definitely way before. As soon as I moved to this country in 2004, like she she told me, like, "Oh, it's ADHD." Somehow, just she just still kept wanting to look more because of my struggling with depression and everything. She kind of wanted to seek mm-hmm. help. I wanted to like, ask her, like, really, really good, like, how did it happen? But she gives me very, very vague answers. What if what you have is autism? And then she told me this. I'm like, what the hell? Like, uh, no. Like, what are you talking about? Like, why would she even say that to me, you know? Like, what she thinks I'm mentally challenged? Like, that's what I thought. <laughs> and like, oh, okay, so now not only I have depression, ADHD, but now I guess I'm, like, doomed for life, I thought, right? Yeah. Like, that's how my mom sees me, apparently. And she showed me this video. And this video was 
I guess like uh, um, Asperger's syndrome was becoming popular. Mm -hmm. And the way that it was explained to, I guess, most of these kids being diagnosed was that you were half autistic, half normal. And the way he said, he started talking about the sensory and about how uh, his behavior issues with people, like how people will tend to misinterpret his bluntness. Social and, uh, interaction social difficulties. And we'll think that, yeah, that he, that he was rude, but he was he never really meant to hurt people's feelings and stuff like that. Yeah. So everything that he said, like he was describing me to a T. And I'm like, Oh my God. It's like, crazy. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> How can somebody else feel the same way that I'm feeling? Mm -hmm. Like I could not, because for the longest time I felt like an alien. Like I feel like nobody feels like me. Like nobody yeah. understands how, how my, how, why I'm so fussy. And I hate being fussy about things, but I just can't help being fussy because I'd rather not eat if I'm going to eat something that I don't like. I'd rather, you know, like literally pop my own ears and hear this obnoxious music, you know, like, <laughs> like it's just really, it was so hard for people to understand like how I would feel and this kid was explaining it. Okay. So from our pre-chat, I thought that instead of, I mean, I've, I've already talked about this, but instead of exploring a specific topic, we'd focus on you. We're going to be talking about your personal story. And from what I know, from what you've told, told me, it all started from your initial move from Mexico to the US, your lack of support by the local authorities, and eventually your battle with drug addiction. So let's start from the beginning. <laughs> okay. What was your experience of moving to the US like, and what challenges did you and your family face? Okay. So for the sake of not making this really, really long, I'm going to skip all the small little details because I do want to just uh, state that uh, there's a lot of little factors and I'm all about the small details, like how did this happen? Like I'm all into details. Yeah. I love telling stories with details <laughs> and I love hearing details in the story because that, um, you know, there's, I feel like there's missing pieces where like, it's like, you know, how do you build a car? Well, first, you know, I think like I want a car like this and then the car is made, you know, I'm like, yeah. Uh, you know, like but, but how the, it, there's a bunch of, you know, so I, I like the I, details, I understand, but yeah. I must skip those details. So pretty much I started experimenting with drugs since before moving here. Um, and that's because I was already experiencing depression. Uh, I struggled a lot with bullying growing up, um, especially in when kids start getting more intense with the bullying, it's like junior high. Mm. Everybody was becoming more socially like aware and everything. And I was a super late bloomer. I was still playing with Barbies and stuff like that. I was still um, very like in my, like I will space out and I will like draw. I was still like a little kid at 12, 13, 14 years old yeah. in so many ways. And kids notice that. Kids notice that. So kids like seeing reactions, right? You know, people in general. Can sort of see that, see that vulnerability in you. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was a really odd person to them in many ways. But now all of them are like my friends' social media. They, they admire, they like, I don't want to say they admire me, but they look up to me in many ways. Like they like me. They didn't never meant to like hurt me, hurt me. They just, I guess they wanted me to interact with them. And that was kind of like their way to try to call my attention. So teasing. Which at, the, which at the time, I didn't understand it that way. I noticed that all my friends were trying to get boyfriends. And I was always kind of like a romantic type. And I always like listen to romantic music and everything. And there's always like a boy that I like from school, but I'll be too shy to talk to him. And there's yeah, so, when I there's so that, much in sorry, there's so much in your story already that I empathize with a lot. Like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> honestly, like it's 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 very it's very spooky sometimes yeah. when when someone's experiences sort of align so with yours. So similar. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and but the the fact that um I started noticing or feeling that I was like the girl that no boy wanted to date, you know, like all of my mm -hmm. friends were these cute, preppy, cute girls that just know how to behave around boys, and I didn't. Like I will do the opposite. I'll be like, I'll try to do something to call their attention, and we'll be like super tomboyish or something, you know, like it would just be super weird. You know what? What really put me in depression, honestly, was my relationship with my dad. Like that, I feel like my relationship with kids, like I, I wouldn't take it as serious, I guess. But what really bothered me was that my dad, I was first child. 
And my dad was just really, really hard on me. My dad, I feel like he's also on the spectrum. And after several conversations we've been having, and but I always thought, I used to think that he was bipolar. So he would have a lot of mood swings. Um, he 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 drinks. He's he never done. He's never done drugs, but he's a drinker. So like I guess when he'll be coming down on like be on a hungover hangover or something or just kind of not drinking, yeah. like he will get in really bad moods. He will be extremely negative. So he will like my dad is the kind of person that dwells on a negative thought. He dwells yeah. on a negative thought and he just keeps on like you know. So he feels so negative with himself and he takes it out on other people and many times i was that other people that's something that that my i think up until actually quite recently it's something that my dad struggled with it a uh sort of things certain things just really got to him and he was to be honest he was he, he was a really good dad and he is a really good dad mm-hmm but sometimes you can just be a bit emotionally cold and yeah. um, sometimes a bit dismissive of my feelings and, and what I'm experiencing yep. and such. My dad's the same. Which goes tough, back to it's like a, I know that he has good intentions and that he loves mm-hmm. me and I guess it's it's difficult to to grow up in a time where autism awareness was so yeah. remarkably different. Yeah. Like my dad lacks a lot of empathy but when he cares he cares he really cares so it was really weird because it was a lot of things that he would do to me that'd be like oh my god he is the cruelest person i ever met but then he will help other people he will help a lot of people so he just wasn't aware of the pain that he was inflicting on me yeah if you know what i mean so it was kind of a lot of things were like i don't understand how can my dad be nice to other people be so cruel to me you know how does that work like what kind of mind does he have yeah. And and um and and everything that he will say to me, just like if the kids will bother me in school, I, it didn't matter. But the fact that my dad will say really really cruel things to me, I'm not gonna say it here because probably sometimes I want to kill my dad <laughs> if I say them. Um, it was it was just so down putting. It was yeah. really down putting. I felt like I was just the most, you know, disappointing person in the entire world that if my dad didn't love me like who else was gonna love me you know like i was just he always made me feel dumb he always made me feel worthless he always made me lazy good for nothing and honestly like i know there's some kids that are lazy and in many ways like i i was like who doesn't like chilling and just like doing nothing right (laughs) but but i wasn't really a lazy kid like i would try really hard like when i would chill i would chill but he would like made me feel guilty for the moments that I just was at home doing nothing or whatever. You know? Yes, yes, I I understand so, that. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of things, and that just uh, at at fifteen, um, I was to me it was really important to be a good kid and never do drugs, never drink, never go to like always did to my, to my dad and never go to like uh, parties past twelve p.m. or something and just kind of like, be a really good kid. To me, that's something was like so important. And when he just kind of like destroyed that, you know, that I look up to like being this person for him, Mm -hmm. um, I just gave up like on, you know what, why even be a good kid? So I just went, it was like a sudden switch. One day I was in the car, he was yelling at me, he was calling me all kinds of names. And in that moment, Mm -hmm. I was just like, that's it. That's it. I'm done. The Francesca that I met to this day, it's done. It's over. And out of like art of magic, like some thing, I called something in the universe where like the very next day I went to school and I was like late as usual. So I was late again. And from all times that I've been late and they would just kind of let you wait outside and they'll kind of like mark you or something. Everyone that was late that day, like they didn't, they, they got suspended. They didn't let went. So usually I will go back home and watch cartoons and eat something. Right. But that day. My friend, I was, it was me, one of my best friends, well, actually my best friend at the time, who just, she was hardly ever late, like would never be outside together. And that day she happened to be late. But she was one of the popular bad girls in school. And, yeah. um, well, not bad girl, but she was kind of like the, the, the popular, like, kind of like, kind of like a badass kind of chick. Edgy. And <laughs> high edgy, yeah. Um, so we were outside and then my friend, she was all like, oh, well, you know, I'm going with my homies then by, you know, or something like that. Like, if you guys want to come with me and I'm like, I'm down, I'll go with you. She didn't believe me because I was such a goody goody. She was all like, Francesca, but if, if you're, we're going to smoke pot 
Like, if you come, you have to smoke. You can't just, like, not. And she just told me that. And I was like, um, I'm down. I'll, I'll smoke. I don't care. And then she was all like, are you serious? Like, I don't believe you. Yeah. And that's that's like a, a complete a 360. I guess, yep. I guess it's sort of like a, in a weird way, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy of your dad yeah. thinking that you're, you're lazy and you don't do anything and you're not good. Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm going to prove you. I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you that, you know, good for nothing daughter that you always think you have, you yeah. know, and that's how I, I just all started. And yeah, that was the first day I smoked weed. And like, literally on the way to the house, she pulled up a cigarette and she was all like, she was all like, here, you want some? And I was like, sure, you know, and I grabbed the <laughs> cigarette and I was like, I didn't even know how to smoke. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's totally me i'm a smoker now yeah and she was all like damn francesca what happened to you and that's how it all started and from there like you you present that drug to me i would try it like i didn't care and i just wanted to be like i i wanted to escape my reality i guess i i just was feeling i was so confused i was feeling so many mm-hmm. i definitely didn't want to be me anymore like then i started kind of like dating I, I wanted to get into dating and i finally dated this guy that i what well, I didn't like, he liked me and I kind of liked them, but I want, I just wanted to have a boyfriend, I guess. And I dated him and I kind of, I started developing strong feelings for him. And then when I noticed that he didn't have the same feelings for me, that's where, uh, that was the first time that I just, it just, that was like the, the drop in my cup of like bad experiences were like, after that, I went downhill to like literally crying myself to sleep oh, every God. night. Yeah, I would cry myself to sleep. It was the first time and I was like, like, why am I crying to sleep? This is so weird. You know, that I'm crying every day. I'm sad every day. I have no motivation. Like, I was just really, really sad all the time. Like, everything that I would do, like, if I one day I wanted to get ready and change, like, I would change myself and try to look good, thinking that maybe I would see him one day. Maybe he would see me and think that I was cute. Like, I was, I was so narrowed down in a small little bubble of, like, I wanted to have one one single person that actually like care for me you know Mm -hmm. so it's time for a quick mention from our sponsors timo if you love visual support in your scheduling timo is for you the app was designed for people with adhd and autism and helps empower users to schedule visual routines that work Users say that Timo can help reduce stress and support executive function, which are both two things that I struggle with myself. Learn more at www.timoapp.com or just type in T-I-I-M-O into your search bar. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Your support means the world. Anyway, let's get back into the show. Could you talk a little bit about your moving to the the U.S.? Uh, yeah. Okay. So about <laughs> the moving to the U.S. So I was already starting to deal with depression, and a, I was all about you know all about kind of like trying to figure out myself, figure out myself and um, my friends and everything. Just kind of like having friends and just being a mm-hmm. teenage trying to figure out my way into being a teenager or what was to be a teenager, right? The last year of high school was actually well, really good. I moved I moved high schools and this other high school, uh, I was I made really good friends and it was really good time. We had a lot of really good adventures. And then all of a sudden, uh, my, my parents' business schools, um, they had to go bankrupt or whatever, close the business oh and decided to, they were going to either start something else there but then they yeah. got the opportunity, like they got a from one of our friends to be like, "Hey, why don't you guys just, you know, come over?" Ask my mom, like, you can stay here or you find a job, and maybe like try to uh, experience living here for a little bit. Like, how did know, you feel about school. that? I was actually really excited because at that time I wasn't ma- like I was kind of like tired of living in that city. I felt like I was like my life was going nowhere. Like I was about to finish high school, and I'm like, where am I going to go? What university am I going to go? What am I going to study? Because I always wanted to do movies, films. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. So staying there was kind of like, okay, what can I study that would help me do films here? You know, it was a very small city. Like, what what was the first like couple of weeks like in the U.S. 
Like, what was the what was the place like? Was it what you thought it would be? Um, no. So at first I was very excited, but once as, as we started uh, actually going to the move, my mom moved and everything. Those two months that my mom was already had moved over there, um, while she was trying to get a get us a place and uh, get us a, jo- a steady job, mm-hmm. uh, it was hell for me. Like me and my dad were like my dad was at this worst depression, so we didn't get along. And uh, we, he put me through so much stress that I ended up actually running away from my house. I was on the streets for a whole week. And finally, he, 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 um, uh, my mom figured out that I was staying with, with one of my friends. And, uh, and he found me. And then uh, there was this whole like family meeting that I done. He promised he was going to change and blah, blah, blah. And then after that, um, another incident happened where on the day that we're supposed to leave, he let me sleep over at my friend's house one last time. But we were actually going go to go to a party because my friends were trying to do me like a goodbye party. But it was kind of yeah. far away and we were moving in bus. So somehow it happened that we ended up there. And the guys, because there was no cell phones or nothing. So the people got tired of waiting and they left. And uh, we were stranded there. And we were trying to get a ride from this other person. And they ended up taking forever to get ride. So bottom line is that I never made it back home. Got in trouble. My dad was so mad. And then he ended up leaving without me. Uh, next thing you know, I was rumbling in this somehow. Like I, I just got scared, and I was rumbling in the streets. I didn't like. I feel so guilty. I didn't go back. Like not even to my yeah. grandma's house or anything. My grandmas were so not nice. I never felt that I could just be like, uh, Grandma, I'm in a situation. Can you help me? And they would just be like, Of course, sweetie, come here. Like I'm here to support so you. Like never. You with open arms. I never, yeah, I never felt that, like, I would literally feel more safe asking, like, a stranger for help than actually asking my grandma. Because the simple feeling of somebody, like, do you go to somebody and this person is like, oh, what did you do now? Like, has that kind of reaction towards you? Makes you be like, never fucking mind. I'm sorry I even called you. Like, you know, it's just kind of like, was one of those things where, like, I don't know, I don't even really think about it. I just felt like there's, I can't ask my grandmas for help at all. And it sounds like you just really didn't have someone to go support. to that, that no. understood or no support. would help. I actually ended up staying at a drug dealer's house. Like this was like one of the heavy drug dealers in the city because my friend was connected. My mm-hmm. friend was really connected with those those people. And uh and we stayed there and yeah, like it's funny that I will feel safer at a drug dealer's home than I than actually asking my own family for help, which is really sad. Right. But somehow yeah, I ended up like is. rumbling, rumbling, rumbling. My friend was with me for a little bit, but then she gets like, she didn't even tell me she calls her mom and then her mom picks her up. And she ends up like leaving, literally like bouncing on me. And so I'm always left all alone. At this drug dealer's place. At this drug dealer's place. And then at some other lady's house too, who she was like, she would also how uh, uh, shelter people sometimes. Like, yeah. There was this one guy, it was just, it was one guy who was there who was claiming that he got in a fight and he actually killed a person. And I was what? just like, you're listening to him tripping as out. A, as that. a good thing. <laughs> huh? As a good thing. No, no, thing. no, no. no. Like he, he was flaunting about it. I think he was, no, he was actually really feeling really guilty about it. Okay. But he was trying to talk it out. Like he was trying to convince himself that that what he did was like what he had to do, you yeah. know, because otherwise this guy was going to beat him up or something, but there was just in a fight and he, there was no need to take out a, a, a knife. And he mm-hmm. took out a knife or something. And he, he stabbed them. And then he kind of like really, like felt like, and then cause he'll be like, yeah, like hey, I, I fucking kill the folks. Fuck with me. And you know, and he was all like, like, you better kill a person. Da-da-da. He had kids. You know, and then he started tripping out. And I was just like listening to him. And I was just, I just couldn't really believe you know, that this was really happening. No, and then finally ended up back in my someone. cousin's house. My cousin, who was my best friend, and we have been, well, I call it uh, just distant for a while. And I ended yeah. up there. I forgot what. I, I went there to ask her for something. And then when I was there, I was just kind of had nothing else to do. And I was there, like, I was telling her what was happening with me and everything. And then my aunt, her mom, comes over. She was like, Francesca, where have you been? And yeah. I was like, well, da-da-da. And she was all like, everybody like is looking for you. I need to take you to your like to, to they've been they've been asking for you, da da da. So I need to take you to your grandma's. You need did to they go call back the police home. or anything? Or does is the police not doesn't really do anything in that area? 
I don't even know if they call the police, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But, uh, um, yeah, there were, I guess I just kind of like rumbled the streets and not knowing that my parents actually wanted me back mm-hmm. in their lives or something. What was the actual like place that you were staying at like? Like, can you describe like what it was, how it was sort of built or, you know, sort of the communities around? Um, well, when I was the homeless, the first, the, this, this, Where, when right you now, came to um, the US, the place that you, you stayed at. When, when I moved to the US? Yeah. Cause I, I think like when we had our pre chat, you were saying about how there was like this big circle of, people big big circle of like houses and stuff you're saying big circle of houses no yes. i think you're i think you're confused when i talk to you about el chavo del ocho how you live in this the community tabula. oh that guy oh yeah. so was, that wasn't you <laughs> yeah well i did describe you how there's this thing in mexico where they're called like vecindad they're like these little communities and the buildings are yeah. all like around it and there's like a middle patio and this kid yeah. lived in there that's kind of like those little like Pro, kind of like a project apartment, like a like very cheaper, 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 more economic apartments that they have in Mexico is very common. They call it communities. They call it vecindad the communities, where all the neighbors are pretty much kind of like really close to each other. Uh, okay, um, sorry, I, I the, uh, the, mis- misheard then. <laughs> okay, so when I moved to the U.S., the apartments were uh, on the outside. They were really nice. They yeah. were, they look really well compared to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> any, any for an apartment like they look actually really decent they have flowers and they're all painted and they were cute they yeah. kind of look like kind of like old school american apartments and they actually i actually they were actually really well taken care of because i've seen ugly apartments in la for example and they are horrible and they charge so much money for them and they look broken they look old they look terrible and these so look good really nice you, you found a nice place then <laughs> mm, not really it just was like painted and have beautiful flowers but the the, the community was terrible like the people that live in those places were just really i don't know i feel like the the, all the horrible people in the world just kind of like lived in those apartments like uh, it was a lot of drug dealing gangsters and at first to me it was like like oh cool you know gangsters like that it was so cool because in that time 2000 early 2000s right um uh hip hop and you know mm. rap and Eminem and Dr. Dre yeah. was really popping. Kind of so popularized the, style, the look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The style was to look like a gangster. Yeah. And I felt like if somebody was a real gangster, that was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so um and and everybody was dressing up all like baggy with their jerseys yeah. and you know, streetwear clothes and everything. The khaki and, pants uh, or jeans. The khaki pants, the cortezes. <laughs> All that stuff, and it just looks so cool. Like they actually dressed up pretty nice. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, it was just a whole world of people who were had nothing. I want to say nothing better else to do, but they could have done better things. They just choose not to. Sometimes you yeah. get involved in a little circle and you just follow what's around what you know, and you don't want to learn more. Yeah. You don't want to learn more than that. So. So I guess, I guess sort of the the next thing that I'd want to talk about. If that's okay, if mm-hmm. I switch topics again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So when and how did you get involved with drug use? And what sort of negative impacts did it have on you and your family and the people around you? Um, so the one that I struggle with a lot, the one that became kind of like my drug of choice, I guess, was crystal meth. And mm. that drug, I... First tasted it in Mexico uh, through a friend. Um, that's because I had already been messing around here and there, like every once in a blue moon with like with marijuana weed and yeah. coke. Um, so when I learned, oh, when I heard of crystal meth, I heard that oh, it makes you lose weight, right? Yeah. And it makes you lose makes you weight, concentrate and do housework. And it makes you feel and... so good. Uh huh. Makes you feel so good and stuff. And it makes you feel like on a good trip type of thing and want to go on missions and stuff. And so I, somebody told me about it, that they were doing it, and they, they described it like that. And I'm like, well, what, what are the side effects? What are the, what's, you know, like, what, 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 what is just going to happen with that? And they're like, no, nothing. You feel good. Like, what right after you feel good and da-da-da? Like, there's no, there's no, nothing wrong with it. You know, but like with weed, you would get really thirsty or 
It will make like kind of like I want to know what what to expect. And uh, yeah, so, so I was already in that boat of like, yeah, I don't care. Like I'll do any drug, whatever. You know, if I die tomorrow, who cares? Can you um, remember when? When was the first sort of time that you took? Yeah. Well, the first time I did it was literally there was like in that school that I was going because I went from private school. Um, I just left the private school because I was having a really hard time with bullying. And yeah. the only other in the middle of the semester. So the only other school that was equivalent to the same type of uh, teaching with that private school was this pro- public school all the way at the end, like kind of like this side of town where I guess there was more drug dealing, yeah. like where the drug dealers had their little houses. So there was a a, a a drug dealer's home really close to school. And one of my friends was school. Yeah. One of my friends was school um, took me there. They were actually really young. Well, mm-hmm. to me, they look older, but they were actually like in their 20s and stuff. And yeah. like early 20s. And they were really hot. Yeah. I guess like there's a lot of sort of uh, stereotypes around meth youth, slight like, teeth falling <laughs> out and shrunken face and... Uh huh. You think those are the ones that you're gonna know, but that that made it look like, oh, these guys look cute and they look cool, mm-hmm. and you know, you feel like you can trust them, right? And we just hung out there. So I remember the first time I tasted, uh, I I I tried it. Uh, I was to smoke and throw foil, and yeah. uh, the first hit was literally I felt every single cell in my brain just popping, and it was like a huge uh, sensation of like uh. Like euphoria. Uh, euphor- yeah, it was definitely euphoria, but it was like I want to think about it. And sense of sensation was more like electricity just going down my spine, down my whole body, like all the yeah. way to my limbs, like everything just felt like, whew, like it was not like the first hit, right? It just felt like that. And I just felt euphoria and I just felt such a great mood. I just felt like my thoughts were like flowing like 24 seven. And I just started talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. And- <laughs> Even more than you do now. Yes, if you think I talk a lot right now, you should see me when I'm high. (laughs) So I started talking and talking and talking. I just felt so good. And it just felt really, it was something that felt really, really good at the beginning. Not only that, but um, being on it, like my friends noticed a change. Like I'll be like, remember my other friends who didn't do drugs from school. Like I hopped in the bus and I was like, hey, what's up? What's up, fools? You know, like I was all being Mr. Cool Guy. And they were like, damn, Francesca, you look different. You look like, like they will say in Spanish, yeah, alivianada, alivianada, which means like you look like cooler now. You look like you're yeah. kind of like, because I guess they will say a lot that I was always like in a cloud. They will call me like, you're all like, you're like flies in your mouth, like all the time, like. Off in your own world. Bad when I was on. I mean, I'm better, I'm better meth. Uh, like, yeah, that was like me grasping all my thoughts and thinking like really rapidly and mm-hmm. just being all like. Like sharp, right? Yeah. Um, which that's why a lot of people get, and that's why they think that amphetamines, that Adderall really, you know, helps your ADHD, helps your autism and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But yeah. I don't really think it helps it. It just makes you feel something else that you're not used to feeling and it makes you think faster, it's, it makes you concentrate faster. Well, it's a, it's a lot about, I mean, for anybody out there who, who doesn't really understand the action of crystal math, it's very much a, a dopaminergic drug. So dopamine's a lot to do with motivation. Mm-hmm. Yep. I think I saw a comparison or something. Um, it was between what what someone would expect the the amount of dopamine units that someone would expect for like um a release, let me say. Yeah. <laughs> Is like uh you know, like fr- like a free. But smoking crystal meth is like a 28 so it's some yeah. it's something that that your brain would never be able to produce to do on its um, own to, to, to do on its own yeah and sometimes with with the dopamine gives you a lot of con it gives you a lot of concentration um and it gives you that euphoria the euphoria um i think it also affects your adrenals as well there's this guy that I watch called CG Kid. Because of my background in biomedical sciences, I'm quite interested in the action of recreational drugs, just as yeah. an interest. <laughs> it's a very strange interest. But <laughs> People get really into it. But it just it, it's just a very insightful way into someone's experiences and 
this guy, CG Kid, he makes a lot of videos about rehabilitation. Um, and his particular drug of choice was crystal meth. Oh. And he said that while he was on it, he would he wouldn't sleep for days and he'd get paranoid, but then he he liked the paranoia and it was like something exciting and he'd do a lot of things that he wouldn't do when he was when he was sober. Yeah. A lot of bad things, you know, to get money and so I used to, I got really into watching uh intervention, which is somebody who's interested in learning more about uh drug addiction and stuff. It's a really good show to watch. It's amazing how a lot of these people get so much support from their families and they still don't take advantage of it. They're so I think yeah, that when it comes down to it, it's just kind of like the core person that you are on the inside. Because no matter what, you can. There's maybe a certain point where you're like, you probably push the edge and do things that you didn't think you would do, but then you won't do it again if it goes against what you value. But sometimes, like when you're in a, in a state of depression and stuff, you start everything that you believe in and you think of yourself as such destroying. So you think of yourself as nothing, and then you start just mm. doing whatever else wants you to do just so you can feel the thing about drugs is that it made me feel something. I had yeah. no sense of direction at that time, no motivation. And I just didn't really understand anything about me, the world, why I have so much bad luck. Well, would things always happen to me type of thing. And I felt that that was uh, a really good feeling to be on it, to be cool. But then, yeah, even though at the beginning I didn't feel the si- the effect, the the strong effects of the side effects, like the burnout, I wouldn't feel that at first. But I still felt that that was just not a good look for me, a good life to be like, oh, like I'm on drugs because I just felt like there was a bad stigma to it, and I just yeah. something told me like it was just against my morals to be like, okay, Francesca, like enough, you don't want to do it again. But then, I like, guess it's sort of a bit sort of self destructive to your confidence, and yeah, your sort of and- your morals and. Yeah, I don't want to be like a person that did drugs. I wanted more than that. But then circumstances just took me to do it again and do it again and do it again. When I was in Mexico, like I was like, done, like I don't want to do it anymore. But then I moved to the US and I felt that I guess I had this like unconscious need to want to fit in and hang out, hang out with these girls that were in the neighborhood and stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I saw them one time that they were smoking weed, I was like, oh, like, I'll I'll smoke with you guys. And that. So I got high with them. This is the first time I tried chronic. And and then the other time they were like uh, trying to do crystal meth. And I kind of knew a few tricks already. So I was like, they were trying to do it with the foil. I was like, oh, do it like that. And that. And then, uh, so yeah, so I just kind of be like, oh, like, I'll be like a good experiment to just, um, mm. get high with them. I thought like to kind of like, get to know them or to hang out, you know, like that was kind of like something that we had in common. So of like a, a method to, to, to connect with people, I guess. To connect with people. Exactly. And, and then from there, it just started kind of like happening that, uh, that was the only way to connect with people. And mm-hmm. there was this other guy, he became my best friend at the time. Uh, he was this like, like older, african-american mm. guy but he was really cool like, i thought he was really cool he knew how to rap and stuff so he he was a good talker and everything so i thought that just i don't know like i was really attracted to his personality to like hang out with him so yeah. when he will hang out that in order for him to kind of get me to hang out more with him he'll be like oh i got you know i got a pookie and da and i got this i got some you know i got some some we'll call it tweak <laughs> tweak being crystal math yeah that's what it is okay and I'll be like, okay, so just kind of like, I guess having that feeling of being invited to do things was yeah. kind of like something that gave motivation. Now, one of the things that I was so, un- I got so unmotivated uh, when I first moved here was, and it kind of gave me to just kind of like, be fuck it, let's do, I guess, hang out with people and do drugs and stuff. was because when I tried to go- join high school, uh, they didn't allow me. They didn't allow me to get in high school because yeah. I was about to turn 18 in three months. Uh, and that was their stupid rule. That was their excuse. It was such a ridiculous rule. Such a ridiculous. ridiculous excuse. They gave me no, that was like, what am I supposed to do? Well, blah, blah, well, you can do homeschooling and da, da, da. They never explained what homeschooling was. They like, oh, you can go to adults high school. And I'm like, yeah. what's that? Those high school has a classroom with people where I can learn things. And they were like, yeah. I'm like, okay. 
that was a lie. That was completely not at all uh, a classroom. It was just a place where you would sit down and do work for three hours, but nobody gave you any class. But so anyway, I suppose that's like you weren't receiving the support for your yeah. education as well. In this yeah, I was having a really hard time uh, trying to go to a regular school and get like the education that I was seeking for from the U.S., which was the number one thing I came here for for an education. And the other thing was that when I I, as soon as I got here, I tried to look for a job and everything, tried to do everything right, and everything just went wrong for me. Mm-hmm. I tried to get, uh, there was a new place, all new quizzes opening down the street from, from where I was living. I was like, oh, this is perfect. Uh, which I call it? I applied and went to the interview and got the job and everything. And literally after the first day, like he was training me. He was training me and teaching me stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I was like super nervous. It was my first job in the u.s ever like i had a job yeah. before like i worked for my grandma in a restaurant and i worked for my dad in his office but it wasn't the same thing like, i never worked for someone else like a job job it was my first job in the u.s and my english was still like not perfect like it was like kind of like it was basic pretty much but i didn't know like a lot of words because i hadn't practiced it in many many years yeah so he was training me and then like literally like not even halfway through the shift or something he calls me to the back and then he tells me like, hey, you know what? Um, I don't think this is going to work out. I don't think I'm going to be able to hire you. He didn't even give you a chance. He didn't give me no chance. Literally, this was his excuse. It was, uh, it was people walking around with hot things. And if you're not, I feel like you're too distracted. I feel like I saw you. I was just talking to you and you were like, you know, looking everywhere, looking at the board. Uh, yes. Eye contact. Yes. Asshole. <sighs> he was all like, you were looking at the board and you were just like not paying attention. And I feel like you're going to like be dropping stuff because you don't pay attention. Oh, like that. That sucks. It's so yeah. horrible to hear stuff like that. Because it just it further sort of emphasizes the Like the, he wanted to give me zero chances. In, in workplaces. Yeah, what a jerk. No chance whatsoever. I just moved to this country and you made me go through this. Right before this happened, right before I got the job and everything, that's when I had already gotten jumped by these girls. Uh, I, I got jumped by six this, girls. Yeah. I was hanging out with these two girls that I was trying to, you know, be friends with and stuff. And then like four girls come over who were friends with these girls. And then they start talking to them and they're saying blah, blah, blah. And they're like, what's up? And blah, blah, blah. And I don't know what they were talking about because I would just kind of be on my own planet most of the time because I just didn't really know what was going on, neighborhood or anything. And then somehow, like, all of a sudden, one of the girls comes to me. And I'm just, like, in my own planet. And then one of the girls comes to me. But I'm also, like, I'm also observing them, like, in my own planet. But at the same time, like, observing and trying to, like, pretend like I'm there, you know, with them. But I'm just, like, thinking about something else. Yeah. And, and then one of the girls comes to me. And, like, she literally tells me that she wants to get down. I didn't even know what the hell that word meant. Like, I was like, what do you mean get down? She was like, let's get down. Let's fight. And I'm like, what? No. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to fight you. Like, why? Why? What did I do? What? What's going on here? Like, I got so, like, my heart just started racing. Like, oh, my God. My dad's going to kill me if I get in a fight here. He told me to not get in trouble. That's, that's terrible. Not- that That's the first thing that you think about. <laughs> yes. That was the first thing that came to my mind. She's going to punch me. What's the big deal on that? Like, what I was scared is that my dad was going to kill me. And probably return me back to Mexico, whatever. Which I think at this point, that that now that I look on his side side, that should have been the best thing he could have done. Like return me back to Mexico because my first two years in the U.S. were the most horrible thing I could have experienced. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, and out of like anger, when I was already like really upset and confused and mad, and I turned around and I was like fat ass. I called her fat ass, and then they started all running after me. They started all chasing me, and then they finally found me. I was hiding in somebody's apartment, and then one of the guys, one of the guys literally told me, like, here, Francesca, what's going on? Let's talk. Come talk to me. And then he guides me all the way to the parking lot and throws me outside and closes the door on me so I can get jumped by those six girls. Oh, God. And all the girls started beating me. Started, uh, uh, they all started kicking me, punching me. And it was a lot of kicking for sure. One of the girls, like, literally threw a can of soda at my face, but it, she missed me by, like, a pair. That's a lot. That's a lot for one person to deal with. And that all happened, I think, within a month. You've got a lot of different sort of avenues of difficulty, you know, with your parents, and I yeah. suppose with with the drug use and with 
other people and getting bullied and work. It's a lot for someone to try and try and try and deal with. Yeah. I mean, where did the drug use sort of come into all of this? Do you think, do you think that it caused any dif- difficulty? Do you think it put a spanner in the works into you progressing and moving out of that place? Did I think that if it put a what? A what? <laughs> did you think that the the addiction and sort of cycles of, of withdrawal from crystal meth kept you in that situation and didn't didn't let you progress i guess it was like a combination of everything to be honest uh the drug use was just my link to hanging out like i i was under the idea i guess that i needed to have friends and the only option for friends were those people in that hood like despite all the bad shit that happened to me, I don't know why there was still some 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 people, some of the guys that were really nice to me. And I guess when you're at a very low point in your life and there's just one person that is nice to you, you just attach to the idea of being friends of that that person is mm-hmm. so important to you. And then I also had this huge crush on this one kid. And this one kid who moved away, and then I started having a, another huge crush on this crush on this other kid. But all these kids like were, were they kids all that, within within the 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 circle of yeah drug this use, r- yeah. circle of a group of friends. Well, they were actually young, and these kids weren't even do drugs. When you do drugs, I don't know why I started doing more drugs or just hanging out with drugs because they were just kind of like available, and it was just kind of like something to do, like kind of like kind of thinking like oh, like drinking, you know. Like at first, I was people, I was able to go home and just pretend like to go to sleep or whatever. It was just something to do. I was so bored out of my mind, to be honest. And uh, drug using was the only thing that I had to do because I had nothing else yeah. to do. I had uh, not a lot of money, you know, to go shopping, to go to a mall, or a friend to go to a mall with me. I didn't have a normal life. I wasn't going to school and have friends from school that I could hang out after afterwards, like like so I used to, your, like a normal person. Drug use was your avenue to to get. To get the connection with people and to get, I guess, yeah, like that was kind of like the, the, one thing, the to motivation and the motivation, the excitement. Uh, when you're young, I think you kind of like see life, like you kind of live like day by day, and I guess whatever occurs to you on that day is what you do. You don't. There's not a lot of planning involved. I was not a really, I never really been a good planner. I, I've been getting better at it now as a, as a much as older as an adult. I mean, I had no direction and my parents were too busy trying to make ends meet to really even pay attention to me and know what the hell was going on with me. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a story. That's the same case with most kids that have uh, the lower class, the lo- lower class in, in the U.S., people who, you know, whose parents make minimum wage and have to work two jobs to be able to survive making ends meet. I think they're just so busy working that they don't notice that their kids are doing drugs, that their kids are gangbanging. Yeah. And that was the case with most of these kids. Did you experience much withdrawal from crystal meth? Yeah, eventually I started uh, after a year, I think, of messing around with it. That's when I started experiencing withdrawals where, like, if I would do it one night, I would have to do it again. If I do it one day and I spend the whole night without sleeping, I will have to do it the next day in order for me to feel kind of like recover because otherwise my brain was just so drained and I felt like I will have these huge like headaches and I will be dizzy and uh, just feel like really bad and depressed and just kind of like, like I will have something to level me up back to, yeah. to norm. Uh, I will never, it, it only happened a few times throughout my whole drug using period. She was kind of like, what, like three or four years that I so actually you, you, went, you just went more some... than three days, went more than three days. But I would always never go more than three oh, days wow. uh, using it because after the third day, I just felt so bad. I would just, I would be like, I need to crash. And I would force myself to just kind of like crash and go to sleep, which a lot of people yeah. don't like the crashing. They, they keep, when I keep getting high, so they don't crash. They don't understand like you, okay, yeah. you need to go to sleep at some point. And I people don't do it. I guess I was smart enough in that sense to be like, I need to crash. And I didn't care. I didn't care if I was in pain. Like, I knew that w- those were the consequences. And I kind of like like feeling that there was pain involved. So it would be like, you need to stop doing this. 
but I wouldn't yeah. care. I would still do it again. The second it was like presented because I would just forget about the consequences. And the moment it was like, I'll be in a fragile state of mind or something, or my friends were like, yeah. hey, dude, like, uh, let's get high. And I would just get excited about, you know, that moment of like, oh, you know, I'm hanging out with my friends and I'm a, I'm part of something, right? I guess as well as the physical addiction, there is also the psychological dependency. The psychological dependency. As well. You know, you, That's what you it get, was for me. You get habituated to, if you see crystal meth, th this is the, good. Like you're going to feel happy. and Yeah. One of the things that is very important to, to take note about this that I feel like uh, now that I look back, I hung out with all kinds of people when all kinds of people when I was um, on this drug and everyone was just so different. Everybody was like on a different kind of like trip and it mm. will affect them all differently. Yeah. It's do you funny, think I would, that, that being autistic made the, made the experience of the drug any different? I don't, I don't know. I don't know because I, maybe a lot of guys I, I was with, say, all, all, all autistics <laughs> are different. One thing that I want to say, the correlation that I noticed is that I guess a lot of people that do drugs in some way, I think what most of us had in common was that a lot of us were like uh, social. Inept, yeah. Socially inept, like we were just kind of like social rejects. We're like, they all kind of like, I remember hearing this comment multiple times. We're like, uh, being on drugs is kind of like made like a middle ground to have yeah. something in common to be able to socialize. Yeah. Because other than that, um, it, it was hard to be accepted in a regular social situation if it wasn't drugs. We were, like the drug made us all kind of be in a very similar level and a similar trip, and there was no judgment. When I would hang around with people with you know with drug addicts, there was no real judgment. I could be weird. I could be all the weird I wanted, and they would even they would disregard a lot of things like, oh, maybe that's a drug, or maybe I don't know, maybe she's weird. Who cares? You know they. There wasn't a real judgment to be like, oh, you have to behave like this. Oh, you have to behave yeah. like that. Not saying that it's not important to learn how to behave in certain such situations, but the way that sometimes people put it out there, they make you feel like you're just not good enough. You're never yeah. going to be good enough to do this. You don't know how to do this. You don't know how to do that. I feel like if my entire life, if I would have cut off a lot of factors out of my life and just my leave it, leaving it down to the only problem, my only problem in my life being the fact that I uh, just behave socially a lot different than other people would have certain comments that were not socially accepted in regards to it will make people uncomfortable or my, the way I would eat. And for example, my grandfather will have this thing where like if somebody was eating something, he will pick on other people's plates, right? Which yeah. is uncomfortable because not, not just for the neurotypicals, but I feel like people who, some autistic people are very delicate. And if you touch their food, they'll be like really disgusted. So everybody has their own ideas. Well, that's why. Having, I was in like having a norm and learning how to kind of like certain things that you don't do in public are important because they are important for other people too. Like some people might not, I would probably not mind my grandfather grabbing out of my plate, but some other artistic people might be very like OCD I would or not, very I like. I would not be. I would not accept like, that with open oh, arms. Here, yeah, I'd be you like, can have what, my entire. What, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah, like what, what are you doing? And he will do it to anyone. Like he didn't care. Like, let me see. I'm uh, um, Let me see. It's a good. He was just speaking like he wouldn't care, you know. And those kind of things is kind of like, <laughs> like yeah. Some of us found it very funny and very charming, but some other people did not. Yeah. My grandpa had an amazing life. He didn't care. So I loved him. I hated him, and it worked for him because he had an amazing, charming personality. So those who love them like like them a lot. But for other people who don't have, you know, that kind of like uh, social thing, charisma. Yeah, that thing where like people, or you're gonna have like, okay, at least I have some friends. I don't need to. I don't need everyone to like me. You yeah. know, um, it, it 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 it's it's gonna affect them to be like, you you should care for other people. You should care how you behave because how you treat other people is how you ex should expect to be treated. Will you expect other people to not care how you feel? Will you expect to other people to not care about you mm -hmm. being uncomfortable? Then why do you make other people uncomfortable? I used to talk to. I used to have this kid that I wanted to help who got diagnosed with ADHD, but he, living with him, he was homeless because his family couldn't deal with him. I let him stay in my house for a couple months. He was a nightmare. He was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And I know that he what, got misdiagnosed. I'm like, dude, you're not ADHD. You're autistic. Like, you need to ask your doctor about that. You need to look into that. 
he had a, a lot of trouble with being, you know, learning how to follow rules and being, you know, how to behave socially. Although he had a certain charm to him at first, but then he would have a lot of problems with. Yeah. He was just a person that you couldn't, you just couldn't be around. Like you couldn't help because it was all about what are you going to do for him? Never what he was going to do for other people. I do understand sort of the, you know, some of the traits of, of autism sort of lend themselves yeah. to perhaps thinking about oneself more than other people. Like yeah. we really, we generally have a, a lack of cognitive empathy. There's like two mm -hmm. types of empathy. One is cognitive, one is adaptive. Cognitive uh -huh. is the ability to know if someone's, uh, what someone's feeling um, mm -hmm. from what they're saying and what they're thinking about. Adaptive uh -huh. is when you know how that person is feeling, how do you act? Yeah. And autistic people don't struggle with adaptive empathy. It's just the cognitive side. Yeah. So there's like, there's a lot of those different things that, that go on in social interactions and like as well being surrounded by people who don't understand you and don't seem to see it your way you're likely yeah. to go the opposite direction yeah and just fight against it one thing that i would always tell this kid his name was julio was like i'm like julio like if you want to be this way the way you are that's fine but you need to go and live in a island like by yourself like in a very small place where you hunt your own food where you just do things on your own if you don't mm. like being around people but if you want to but you do like being around people you hate when we go out and we don't invite you because i like first of all we can't pay for you, you don't have money and second of all you um you cause scenes and you put us in a lot of trouble like you put us in trouble like almost with the law and stuff you do things that yeah. we just you're a liability all the time to us so we can't take you to places and you get mad when we don't take you to places. And, but you don't put on your part. You, you don't yeah. want to miss out on things, but then again, you don't want to behave. So you, you, you are capable of changing. You're capable of behaving. You're just very stubborn and you don't want to put your mind into that, making that extra effort. Mm. That's kind of a, it's, it's a bit, it's weird, isn't it? Cause we, we are in sort of a time where we're putting a lot of effort and a lot of focus on accepting who you are but i guess the the sort of the flip side of accepting who you are is changing and adapting changing and adapting and i think from what i've seen people don't give that changing adapting and working on yourself and improving yourself in ways that you want to improve and that ways that will help you yeah as important as that and some people can get a bit caught up with that and a bit of obsessed with you oh well if you don't accept how i behave or treat treat yeah. you then go away like exactly. you should you should listen to me you know yeah and I, was on that I, too. I understand it because it's like i mean i i used to, to have that sort of mentality it's, me too me too when you've had such bad experiences with life and with people and you've been treated so badly of course you're gonna feel like that like <laughs> you're gonna yeah. fight back at it I guess sort of another aspect of sort of getting getting out of that place would be a change in your lifestyle, like yeah. the things the things that you love, and I guess for snowboarding to you, as you you said, it was it's like your drug of choice. <laughs> yeah, now. and 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 now I can do like I I go on the jumps on the like the, the big hills. Uh, I'll yeah. put putting some more videos on my Instagram, but there's one right now if you want to check when we're done with this conversation. I check the story. I put a little one, a little a reel. Where I'm, um, let me have a look. Yeah, you can check that the reel that I that I posted, and you can see kind of like how much better I've gotten, and and I go on the jumps and everything. So that's something that I never in in a couple of years I gotten so far on snowboarding, you know, just a couple of years uh, practicing, and never in a million years I thought I would be able to do all that. So it's all about positive thinking too. Mm. I used to think like people tell me like, oh, you're so negative. I would hear this comment once in a while. And I'd be like, no, I'm not. I'm like the opposite from negative. I'm like super optimistic. But I couldn't tell the I couldn't differentiate the difference. How yes, I'm very, I'm a very optimistic person. Sometimes a little too much. Or like sometimes like the ideas that I have or the optimism that I have is unrealistic. Yeah. And then I get disappointment. And I get this I set myself for disappointment because of the high, sometimes unrealistic uh either ideas or goals or whatever that I set so. expectations that I set myself to. So I set mm. myself for, for disappointment. I find, I find, you know, the difficulties that you've been through, 
you know, it's 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 a horrible ordeal and sequence of events that you've had to experience. Yeah. And yet you you know, you've come out the other side and you've you've found your passion and your spark for life and you've worked on yourself and you've developed yourself and gone for things that, that motivate you and it's it's incredibly inspiring, Francesca. Like Thank you. I think it's 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 really important for people to to hear stories like this because I guess when we when we hear about, for example, drug use or alcohol use or addiction of any kind, we kind of superimpose an idea that this person is not a normal person. Mm-hmm. If if that makes sense, you know, like yeah. I, I what I find interesting is the the humanity aspects to um people who use drugs the just like everybody else but circumstances and mental health and difficult places have caused them to to fall or succumb to to this yeah. substance and i think it's really important to talk about things like this yeah yeah i i wish i would have met someone like me uh, when i was younger Somebody would tell me like, hey, Francesca, you know, I've been through where you are. The same thing happened to me, da, da, da. But I cut out the toxic things in my life and started looking for how to move forward, looking, you know, going going forward and, 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 and progress, you know, if you have goals in life. I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with having a simple, simple life, you know, but even to have a simple life, it's, it's, it's a goal. Right. Some people just want to, you know, get married and be a mom and have kids, you know, but it's like, uh, well, your goal is to be a mom. I assume you want to be a good mom. So what a good mom be like, you know, would a good mom be the mom that does drugs in front of their kids, you know? So all those things that you, you got to set yourself a goal and be like, how am I going to get to this point? It's a, it's a decision. Yeah. There's trauma from my past where like, you know, all this, negative things that have been mm. said to me throughout my life. Yeah. For example, doing YouTube has been hard for me because uh, it's a tough audience out there. It's a very tough audience. <laughs> yes. And, yes. And I, I feel I'm like sure that, just, that, in many sure times I got this, I get, this <laughs> <laughs> I get this little voice, you know, this negative, the negative yeah. me telling me like, like, but just go, what were you thinking? What were you, how could you possibly believe that people were acting, you were actually going to like you, you, okay. Yeah. Like, no, you're a nobody. You're going to, you're a fraud. You're, you're going to fail. Nothing that you do every comes out, ever comes a ride. You're going to fail miserably. Francesca, you are, you are striking at the core here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, any, any video that I upload, I, obviously I'm always sort of, increasing my energy and trying to perform in some way you know to make it sound good and make it more engaging yeah and so anybody who doesn't know who i am and what i've been through they come on to my youtube channel and they say like well who are you you're not like you're not like me you don't understand here are all the things that you've said that are wrong in this video and the reasons why you're wrong and you should contemplate your life and if i'm in a bad place like that is it not the thing you. that I need to hit to hear. It's not going to yeah. encourage me to keep trying to make a difference. You know, like I'm kind of, I'm feeling very happy because we have in our little sort of ranty conversation, we have <laughs> made our way through pretty much all of the questions without structure. So I guess, right. We kind of like, you know, <laughs> connected the, the dots. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I did say that we were only going to have two hours to to uh-huh. talk. It's been um, two hours. No, it's been it's been nearly three hours. But oh my god, it's gonna Are you be serious. It's okay. Oh my it's god, fine. it's, I'm the it's worst. been good. I'm gonna. It's gonna be my first step yeah. towards um, becoming the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be good. Yeah, Joe Rogan does. My boyfriend loves hearing to Joe Rogan. But I'm just gonna make it long. Like if people don't want to listen to it they don't have to but you don't do like, like two parts or something who... like that you do like, <laughs> no. like a two because people can always <laughs> no. listen to the other part later right Maybe yeah but like, people oh, can I'm always gonna... stop the podcast whenever stop they the want as well yeah I, I i'm gonna try and keep in as much as possible because 
you know, the people who do stick around and, and listen to it and want to listen to it, they're going to find a lot of use in, in your experiences and, and what you've taken from life. Like, I, I definitely have, and I'm, I'm very in, feeling very inspired by it. <laughs> no matter what time it is, it doesn't matter that it's midnight and I've got work tomorrow. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Is it really midnight over there? Yes. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I've enjoyed wow. myself though. Thoroughly. I appreciate you staying up, staying up this late. Well, what I want to ask you first is, throughout the entire podcast, <laughs> uh, what three main things do you want people to take away from it? Help me out here. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> we what, what, do you take out, what do you take out of our conversation? Ooh, nobody's, nobody's turned it on me like that. Um, <laughs> I think that, although it may be sort of glaringly obvious to both of us, I do think that it's important to listen to everybody without judgment. It's important. It's important to judge and judge people's characters, and it's not. It's something that we do naturally as human beings. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, especially with things that are such so taboo, like drug use, people sort of immediately place people into a category of not being a normal human being. Mm -hmm. And not being having, relatable. Ha having issues. I think it's important to highlight that that's not the case. And that there's some something brilliant and something inspiring to learn from every person that's been through something like that. Yeah. That's mine. You yeah. can go for the next one. <laughs> uh, I do. I think it's always good to give, to be, learn how to take constructive criticism. Because mm. that constructive criticism might help me. It's that can be point wanna, number two. <laughs> yeah, some people don't like to give it because they feel like the other person's going to get offended. It's yeah. good to not take things offensively. Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, take rub a step it off your back. shoulder. Yeah, rub it off your shoulder if it doesn't apply to you. But do appreciate the fact that that person is taking that in, that in matter into you. Like if they're taking their time to give you constructive criticism, they care to some degree. They care to some degree to help you. Because they think that what they're going to tell you is going to help you better. So just many, many of the tips that I, people will give me, I would just kind of put them in the back of my head. And then I wouldn't apply them to later. Then I wouldn't understand until later, later. So le learning how to take constructive criticism is good. And also giving constructive criticism is good. The other thing is don't dwell on the past. Don't dwell on negative things. Things that happen to you that are painful to you or were some kind of traumatic to you and they hurt you to a certain degree, you know, learn from that and try to see how you find a way to never be in that situation again, to never mm -hmm. put yourself in that situation again, but don't dwell on it. Uh, don't make that um, define you, you know, if you've been a victim of abuse, if you've been a victim of whatever, don't let that be like, oh, now I'm the person that was abused as a young person. I was a person that I was, you know, hit that I'm, I'm that person. Like, no, you don't have to be that person. That's something that happened to you. Unfortunately, this has happened to a lot of people, but you're alive today. You are past the situation that's part of your past. And that made you a stronger, wiser woman. And now you can, you know, use that experience to either help other people or advise other people on uh, it. I like that. Learn yes. from the past. Learn from look the past, to the but future. don't dwell. Yeah, and don't <laughs> dwell on it. So we have the very, very last question, and this is an open question. What does autism mean to you, Francesca? You know what? For the longest time, I, was, I got really obsessed with like getting into the, the meaty-greedy of, like, okay, how did the whole autism thing start? Francesca. Okay, so... <laughs> what does also, autism mean to you <laughs> okay and then i, then I sidetracked okay so what I, was, okay. What, I, what I meant what i what i was going to was that <laughs> i don't think it's something that needs to be needs to be medicated pretty much yeah. like i don't even think it's something that needs to be medicated it just needs to be understood well francesca this comes to the very end of the podcast have you enjoyed your experience? Yes, very much. I feel like I needed a 
have this conversation with someone because when I have this conversation <laughs> with regular people, they're like, well, oh my God, you all you talk is about autism. There are many people who, who have podcasts and do videos and stuff and I'm very happy to put, put you in contact with them. Oh, and so that, so that you can good. spread spread your story and spread your work a bit easier. And is there about autism too? Uh, uh, yeah. Podcast about autism? Oh, wow. Great, great. That'd be great. <laughs> I very much enjoyed our conversation. It has been very long um, and it is very late, but I have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Same, same here. I'm so grateful. <laughs> I'm so very grateful. <laughs> well, would you like to give out any links to your work? Uh, well, my channel is called Neurodivergent French Fries. I first I called it because uh, I thought it'd be funny, but I, I don't French, think a lot of French, people French fries and uh, Asperger's. French fries with Asperger's because <laughs> that's what they always told me because I people call me French fries and that was my nickname and and, and then as a as a you know inside uh, joke whatever I'd be like I was wondering where French it fries? came from. Yeah, they were like, do you want some French toast with your Asperger's? You know, they would always tell me that. So I'm thinking like, I'm going to call my channel that. Uh, but I don't think a lot of people thought that was that funny. And your social media, is that the same? Yeah, Neurodivergent French Fries. Neurodivergent French Fries. And my business, one of my, my first business name is called Excellence Cleaning Pros. Any clicks mm -hmm. on the website helps my SEO. Yeah. <laughs> and also uh, Sick for Trees. With my partner, he's sick the, for trees. He's the creator. I'm the I'm the brains of the operation. <laughs> cool, and I will put all of those links down in the description. Awesome. So, if you want to check out the Forty Orty podcast anywhere else, you can always find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the Asperger's Growth YouTube channel, or you can find it now on Google Podcasts as well. Very interesting. <laughs> if you want to stay up to date with my work and what I'm doing, I've recently started a new job at a non profit organization and I'm doing a few things with the autistic community to raise awareness, specifically around Autism Awareness Week, um, which has been very interesting at the moment. It's, I think, an un unappreciated side of my work, sort of working with organizations and interviews and stuff like that. But it, it would always mean a lot for you, for you to tune in. Maybe send me an email. Maybe send me a DM. Um, let me know if I'm, what I'm doing is good and if you're enjoying it and what you don't like about it as well. I am rambling my head off. If you want to check out some videos around autism, mental health, and dating and relationships, you can find all of those on the Asperger's Growth YouTube channel. Or if you want to just get a nice little overview of all of that stuff, you can go to my website, thomashenley.co.uk. Francesca, thank you very much for coming on today. I've had a really good chat with you and I'm sure that anybody listening is massively appreciative of how open you've been with your experiences and so emotionally vulnerable. I'm very lucky and I'm very honored to, to have spoken to you about this. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for having me and taking interest in my story. <laughs> well, this comes to the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. We have Vinut. Have you got any parting words? Oh my God, did I prepare for this? <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone for listening. Uh, if you guys listen all the way to the end, I really appreciate uh, any support and just, you know, being understanding of you know the circumstances that each one of us spectrum goes through and i hope that uh, my story in any way resonates to you guys and uh any any comments you guys want to or questions you guys want to leave me on my social media or my youtube i'll be more than happy to answer because i hardly get any you know any any messages uh, like that brilliant because that's that's it i'm really honored to be here brilliant see you later folks Thank you. <laughs> you cut it right there? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, we'll I don't know. I'm like, on. is he going to turn off the screen right now? And I'm just going to be like. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and then bloop. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh.